Uh, so, excellent, thank you. Uh, so, Raymond or Guy, uh, if one of you can share your screen. I don't know if it'll, it'll be Raymond or, or Guy uh, during the uh, time zone. Yeah, also, I, I have something planned, but um, uh, I want to just double check with Guy whether she has anything planned too, because I, I maybe I misheard something earlier, but I wasn't sure now. Oh, uh, no, yeah, please, please go ahead. Okay, okay, thanks. Um, okay. So we're going to try this out and uh, see how we can get here. So, okay. So, so firstly, briefly, I'm just going to start my, my browser here just to highlight the instructions. So um, there is some, some hands-on, but uh, I decided to put it in the, the stat repository itself. So um, I just uploaded this uh, today. So uh, I'm not sure if folks have seen it yet. Um, so to highlight here, what you need to do is you need to go pull the changes from the uh, repository. So uh, to do that, all you have to do is go to your, your Jetscape Docker directory here. Um, as you've been working, in, go into the stat directory, which you already should have cloned during the setup, um, git pull, and then you want to check out this particular branch. Um, and so, right, if you do that, you'll get basically what's in this repository. I've just shifted to the other uh, tab, which is uh, just, just fine. Um, so you can do this inside or outside of your Docker container. Either way is fine. Um, but uh, once you've done that, I can't find my Zoom window now. Uh, you'll want to... Um, I actually don't know how to get out of this now. I went full screen on Zoom window. That's now. Oh, I see where it is. Okay. Um, okay. Put that over here. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chinina, for the link. Um, so uh, let's. So it's going to be in a Jupyter notebook here. So let's let's do that that quick setup together. Um, so we'll use our our Docker container as we have been, um, and uh, we'll we'll start it from there. I hope this is. Uh, old hat by now. Um, so either if you don't have your Docker container started already, right, you'll want to do docker start dash AI in your new container, which should be uh, my jet ski. Then enter, you should end up at a, a prompt. Um, hope this is familiar to everyone at this point. Um, if you haven't seen already, also all the te text that I write should be near, near in the right corner in case uh, Anything's unclear. Um, okay, so once you're in your Docker container, uh, right? We want to be uh, we want to move to the stat directory. Or, uh, yeah, it's fine. And then uh, we want to type. Uh, we want to write this this Jupyter notebook command that we've been using. Right, go into IP address zero and uh, not launch in the browser, and we'll continue our usual game here, launching our. Uh, are uh, your uh, your URL or your sorry your notebook? Um, I'm gonna switch back to my my web browser now to uh, load this in. Um, too much of um, okay. Uh, so as usual, you need to do the the copy you do. I need to make a small edit. You don't need to do this. Just uh, do it as you usually would. Okay, um, and so we want to open this hands-on uh, 2022. And so, uh, okay, so then to get started here, uh, okay, maybe I can pause for a moment. Uh, uh, sorry, have we been doing polling to, to check if folks are, are caught up or are we just uh, pausing at times? I think we can actually do some polling. So, uh, you yeah. know, folks that, you know, have uh, gotten this, uh, this is sort of running on their end, just react with a, with a yes. That would be great. So a check mark, oh, yes. And then, so once, you know, most folks have, uh, have clicked yes, then we can move on. Okay, so mm -hmm. there's uh, three out of uh, 31, so. Mm -hmm. Wait for a few more check marks. Okay, we have five. Okay. 
And if you have any questions, feel free to ask on Slack on Zoom. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, okay, maybe we can move on. Uh, but okay. again, yeah. sure. Let's keep moving here. I'll, I'll discuss what we're doing for the start here in any case. So maybe let's focus catch up. Um, so I'm basing this on some more materials in from me. So thanks uh, again for, for the space here, uh, for all this content. So uh, today, what we're going to do is we're going to, as an introduction to using the stat package, we're just going to use a toy of the object asymmetry. Um, as a brief reminder for folks, um, what I mean when I say that that's the symmetry in this case, I mean AJ. Um, so AJ is defined as, as basically the difference between two jets, uh, the, the momentum difference, or sometimes the energy difference is defined here. Um, this can be a little bit bigger than the folks can read this okay. Um, so, uh, so um, right. So, uh, this was one of the early measurements, for example, that was shown at the LHC, and it's really quite nice, I think, in some sense, because you can really see it by eye, basically, right? So here's this, this event display, from this, this atlas measurement, and you, you, know, you can see the jet and the, the tracks and the calorimeter towers on one side, and you look at the away side, and just, it's, uh, it just looks like your background, right? So really, your, your wayside jet has somehow disappeared. And so... Uh, you can then go try and quantify it, for example, with this, this measurement um, now from 2010. And uh, okay, if you look in, so we have three things plotted here. So one, you have the lead lead in, in black, you have the PP in, in these open circles, and then you have hygiene uh, with the pithy embedded signal in it uh, in, the, in the yellow. And if you look in this, this peripheral case, you really don't see any modification to this distribution. But if you look in, for example, the 0 to 10% was central, you see this, this quite large modification to lead light tricks. Now, um, as an experiment book, uh, I feel compelled to point out that this is a, a smeared measurement. Um, so this shape ends up looking a little bit different. One, one ends up uh, unfolding, uh, which uh, folks have more recently used this, this XJ approach um, for basically experimental reasons to make this easier to unfold. But uh, you're looking at the same concepts one way or another. So uh, today, I think we'll focus just on the AJ because it's uh, I think it's nice to think about conceptually. So um, this is the measure we want to work with. Um, what are we going to do for our, our energy loss toy? Um, so uh, you know, one could try and construct something many different things. Um, for today, we'll construct a fairly simple jet energy loss model that basically is uh, you have some fractional energy loss that's proportional to a Gaussian here. So you just have one factor of scaling, some Gaussian, some fixed width. So basically saying you're always going to have some, some loss in this particular case for these die jets. And so we, we like each die jet use, uh, you know, we sample this, this Gaussian distribution uh, and we let each one do it separately. Um, so uh, that will give us our, our kind of main energy loss contribution that we'll try and uh, uncover. But then we also have an additional, so we, we, we apply this, this directly to the, the jet PT when we're constructing our HA. Then we also add an additional uh, apparent smearing term directly to our, our AJ itself. Um, and so this is coming from the fact that you have other things going on in your events. Uh, you have three jet events, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, you have these different contributions that could also basically add to some smearing of the AJ itself. And so, uh, we will also parameterize this as a Gaussian, but now with a different parameter. Uh, so in this case, we'll use this the second parameter B um, with, uh, with the mean center at, at zero. Um, so thinking kind of the approximate balance digest. Um, so this means we, we're only trying to work with two parameters here. Um, so we have this, this very simple toy, and the reason we're doing the simple toy is so we can focus on thinking about the, the, the code and what we're doing as opposed to you know, being so focused on our physics here. Now we do at least want to try and you know really constrain these in, in uh, a meaningful way though, and so what we'll try and do here is we'll consider it, um, the the measurement done in two different centrality rings. So one uh, we'll look at central. So again, where we expect to see some modification with our toy, for example, and then one in peripheral where we expect not to see modification here. So just uh, um, you know just the uh, just the smearing and. Uh, Wow, this got uh, stretched out a little bit. Okay, let's make this smaller for just a moment. The table's readable. 
Uh, the point is basically you can try and you can do a, basically a matrix of you know, central and peripheral both versus the different contributions. And so in central, as I said, you have the quenching and the smearing together, whereas with the peripheral, you have uh, just the smearing. Uh, sorry, this rendered a little bit differently on my computer previously, but uh, okay, I hope you get the point of the table. So, um, so let's do our basic setup here. Um, I'll just note that a lot of the code is kind of parameterized. So what I show you here, you can mostly, but not quite uniformly adapt to say some different observable, you add some new things. Uh, it's pretty straightforward to, to run for whatever case you might be interested in. So let's get going here. We'll start by loading our, our basic packages here. Um, and so the step one, I want to focus on on the input files here. Um, so as I noted in the, the presentation here, um, right, if you want to do this, this really full-scale Bayesian analysis, you really want some organization. You want to know what kind of what you're doing here. Um, if you are, uh, you know, even if your experimental measurements are coming from HEP data, they all look different. Uh, um, there's, you know, a, enough parameter space that you're always going to have to be dealing with these, these kind of difficulties. And so um, the stat package really provides this, this formula, this kind of standardization for you to, to be able to work with this. And so I want to go through these, uh, look at these different files briefly. Um, so to do that, we'll define a quick helper function. All these do, uh, they're very, very simple. They're just so that we can print particular parts of the file um, so we can focus on different sections. And then we're also gonna uh, create some, some paths just for convenience in terms of, uh, uh, you know, common things we'll use. So, uh, right, so th there are three classes of files that, that we, we define for this, this stat class or for the stat package. So one is the, uh, are, are the data files, right? These contain measurements from the experiments itself, um, right? And they, it has to be fairly flexible format because, um, you know, depending on what observable you're looking at, it may have um, quite different uncertainties. Um, just as a simple example, uh, with the Hadron RAA, I mean, oh, as we've already seen, in fact, from, from E, right, uh, showing this, this plot of the CMS Hadron RAA, there are all these different contributions, right? So, um, you know, they use these correlated ones, uncorrelated ones. If you add jet measurements, for example, you'll start to see things like shape uncertainties, which are anti-correlated. So you want to try and account for all these, these different things within one particular format. So uh, that's what we'll take a look at one of the data files here, in this case, the central one. And I'll go through the details, but basically the, the broad idea here is you have some header, you have some uh, you know, general header with you know, what you put in, you have some uh, uh, you know, particular header for the values you store, and then you store whatever values might be interested in. Um, so let's, let's be a little bit more precise. So we can first look at this, this header, um, and this is basically specifying the information you need to be able to reconstruct the data later. If you got this file, you know, where does it come from? So things like the DOI, in this case, we have our toy, so we didn't specify the UI, but um, you know, uh, what system it's from, the centrality, all this kind of information to keep you uh, informed about what you're working with. Next is, is basically the step that lets us work with all of the, uh, with all the complexity that these, these experimental measurements can, can include. So we have our, our bidding information, our central value, and then, for example, in this case, we have a breakdown where you have a low and high statistical uncertainty, which may or may not be symmetric. You also have a low and high systematic uncertainty, which, again, may or may not be symmetric. But you could also imagine adding additional classes, right? So you could have, again, this, you could have this luminosity uncertainty, or you could have this uh, shape uncertainty. All these different options, they can just be added as uh, additional columns. And this is something that uh, I'll get to in a moment. We have some classes. Uh, and code for, for doing this in an automated manner. So this is not something you're you know generally making by hand yourself, but instead are you know importing a head data file or or something you got from experiment. Um, and then lastly, uh, we have our our data itself. And okay, since we're printing scientific notation, it's uh, not quite so nice to read here. But you know the point is you have each row corresponds to a data point with the the particular information, and you can you know read the whole file. Uh, there's no point staring at this now, but this at least you know, gives you a sense of this. So next, uh, we have our design points. And so uh, the design points right, are, are these, these parameters that we're going to run our simulation for some subset of them to try and uh, provide enough information to then be able to train our, our GPEs uh, to, to cover the rest of the, the parameter space. And so uh, again, it's, it's, you know, we want to make sure that we really keep track of these. 
this type of you know, information that's stored here both is critical for running your simulations, but then later for you know kind of understanding where you know if you want to understand your performance, you need to know where you run these. Um, so again, we take a quick look uh, just to get a sense. This is truncated, but um, uh, right, we can focus in, for example, on the header. In this case, it's really very minimal information. Um, and so I want to. So here, it just says you know whatever version, and then what parameters that we we simulated. Since we're doing or uh, since we're doing this this AJ example, we're using just parameters A and B. Um, I do want to highlight though what I'm showing you here are generally speaking kind of the minimum uh values in the header that are required which is to say you can always store additional things so for example one piece of information you might be interested in uh, is uh is and certainly we'll use it later is how wide of the parameter range did you use right did i simulate or did i uh distribute a over you know 0 to 0.5 or minus 10 to 10 right this this can be quite important um as you as you've seen before and so uh, you could, for example, write that as another line to your header here, uh, which would be perfectly fine. It won't interrupt with our reading, but it will let you store that information with that. Um, so, for example, that, that kind of addition can be very nice. Um, this, this I made by hand, uh, so uh, you can always just add this in. Um, and then, uh, okay, the data itself is not so surprising here. It's Each row has a particular set of parameters that you might try and simulate. A and B following the, the order in which they're in the, the header here. Um, so then lastly, the prediction files, and I know I'm going through this in quite some detail, but I, it's, I find it's quite useful to at least know, what's, know what you're kind of looking for. And we can play the same game here, but now the, these prediction files look a little bit different. So um, again, our header information has, uh, again, just our specification of the version. Uh, it tells you what data that it corresponds to. And this is quite this is quite important because uh, the these parameter files don't store the the binning of the observable in it, right? The binning is is somehow a choice that the experiments have made uh, that you want to match when you make your comparisons, but isn't necessarily uh, you know you could uh, if you have the original data, right? You could always remeasure and uh, change the binning on your observable. So we we choose to kind of uh, to deduplicate this information and store it just with the data. So you need to know what this link is so that you can, for example, example extract the, you know, the binning on, on what I mentioned that you're looking at. Um, and then of course, equally, right, uh, you want to know what the uh, what parameters you ran, and uh, that means you need to know which what the name of the design file is uh, that you that you used. In this case, we just call the design.dat, very generic, but uh, you want to try and keep that information. Uh, matching up with each other. Now, I think this is the last piece, which is maybe most critical, which is that, so I printed just one line, one, excuse me, one row of this predictions file. And, uh, and you'll note that there's a lot of values here and uh, a lot more than you would have thought if you were expecting kind of bin by bin by bin. And so what it turns out is that for the predictions file and kind of uh, to, to uh, enable calculations later, the, this format is defined such that each row is has all of the data from one design frame. So, right, if you count this up, you'll see that we have, in fact, forty different numbers here for this first row. And uh, and if you go back to uh, it, and so you can actually you know you count these, which is what the second line does, and you see it's forty design points, which in fact is exactly how many we generated. Um, the rows themselves then match up with the binning that's in the, the experimental file. Again, like I emphasized, it's deduplicated. Um, so uh, you really want to put those two files together to be able to make sense of it. So you want to keep, uh, by doing this, you, you kind of link all the files together. Um, okay, so I've said a lot of words um, and uh, I think it's important, you know, if you do this, maybe you'll come back to this later if you're trying to understand the, these files, but uh, for now, Fortunately, uh, you don't have to worry about these details. We give you the, the ability to, to kind of take care of these files and do set, uh, for you. So let's actually go make our step here and let's go load our, our data. So um, we can do it through this, this reader class, which has, or this reader module, which has some different uh, functions. So there's one that reads data, which uh, unsurprisingly reads our data in. And so we have our two selections our uh, selection one, which is our central bin, 
and our selection two, which is our purple event. This is just a convention that was chosen. Um, the reader also can read a covariance, so basically some matrix for the file. Um, for this case, we're, we're choosing not to do that. We'll estimate the covariance below, but uh, this can be quite useful. For example, if you uh, you know externally, if you have uh, you know a covariance uh, provided by an experiment, for example, or you're able to estimate some aspect of the covariance, you can combine these different sources together, and so this this gives you a convenient way to kind of read them in. Um, so certainly something to keep in mind. We uh, also have you know functionality to read our design points and our our model predictions as well. Um, I will just emphasize again, of course. I'm, you know, we're providing model predictions here. We're using our toy calculation, um, you know, so that that these these pieces all fit together. Um, but uh, of course, right, this can be quite a this can be uh, an effort to you know to actually run all these these predictions. So okay, we've got that. Let's run it, and it's already executed. We've got our our files all stored in. So uh, this this oops uh, right so. You'll notice that we've basically read into these these different values, and basically they're all these different variables. And what they are is is dictionaries. Um, so we can take a quick look here. For example, the keys in in the data file and this data dictionary. And so we see, for example, right, these are basically the the values out of the header that we're pulling out now to keep track of. Um, so we provide these. You, know, you can play the same game for the, the predictions, for example. Um, Right, there's somewhat less information, right? Because we uh, have linked these together. Um, but this really gives you all the raw information. And, and based on this, we can construct uh, the information we need. Um, so, uh, with that, uh, so basically, as I said, this, this is giving you in some expected format. Um, and what's pretty really nice about it, it's easily convertible and, and consumable out of the stat package. Um, I already estimated, uh, so I already kind of highlighted. Uh, um, there's this uh, read covariance here, and there's estimate covariance below, both of which will give you kind of the opportunity to work with whatever you have available. So, uh, right, so we, we read the inputs above, um, and we're almost there. Uh, I promise we'll, we'll get to interesting things in just a moment. Um, but I want to emphasize this because once you get the setup going, it's very easy, right? But you you got to get the setup uh, uh, put together to, to be able to, to kind of work with things. Um, and so, we need to now make a second step where we go from kind of the raw information that we've read in to putting in a format that the package is expecting. And um, although this may at first seem like something that should be pretty easily automatable, uh, depending on how you want to group observables together, um, you know, how you really want to actually try and define your analysis, this can be a pretty general problem that's not necessarily so straightforward to automate. Um, so here we'll have to do a little bit of work to, to kind of put together the information. Uh, but once we've done this, uh, this, the package will kind of take care of things for you. So what we're going to do is we're going to pack up a, a dictionary to contain all this data. We generally are going to call it all data um, very creatively. And this will be a little bit like a, a, a somewhat global object keeping track of this. Um, so you want to be a little bit careful about this um, object, uh, but um, you know, as long as you kind of uh, work with the way I've described, you should be OK. Um, before I get into further here, let me pause for just a moment to ask if there's any questions about the the file format of the reader or anything I've talked about so far. Um, I said a lot of words, which are maybe a little abstract right now, um, so we can also wait until we we get going. But um, yeah, we we certainly can discuss now too. Raymond, would it be good for me to do like a quick poll? Just to see if our folks are. Sure, we can do a quick poll here just to make sure that folks are at least up to this yeah. point. We're about to start the analysis. Excellent. Okay, so uh, if uh, you all are, are up to speed in terms of the analysis, uh, in terms of you know, following along here, just uh, again, uh, check mark, green check mark. Okay, I see a lot of green check marks. Wait a little bit. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. I think we have a lot of green check marks, so I think we're okay. Make it to okay, very good. Um, yeah, so hey, everyone, thanks for, for bearing with this this setup here, and now let's actually do some stuff. So, um, so we've got our our we're going to set up this this all data um, 
this all data dictionary. And to do that, we're going to do this uh, for our two different centrality bins, central and peripheral. Uh, it's kind of exhausting to write these, so we're going to set up these variables there to help us out. And so um, kind of as a first step, we need to set up this basic information. So we're talking about things like telling what systems we're going to work with. In this case, our toy, we're just going to say it's a blood blood at 5 TED. Um, we need to know what parameters to actually look at, right, which are stored in our, our design, so we don't have to put this in manually. Um, we need to know what the parameter ranges are, right? So this is something you could have stored in the design header. We didn't uh, in this particular case, but uh, so we're just putting this in by hand. Um, and then lastly, what you really want to pay attention to is basically to um, uh, the observables that we're going to define, right? So here we're saying we're going to define some, some group of observables, AJ. Uh, we're choosing that name, and uh, it's going to be in this tuple with a list of all the relevant measurements, uh, the names of all the relevant measurements. In this case, right, we're doing central and peripheral. Um, so, uh, right, so that's that's the basic setup. So we can execute this. Just need to keep it in mind, um, and now we can start packaging our data up. So first, we want to start with our data points, and here we're just kind of following the structure. We'll have a structure where we generally go from system to observable, and then some some sequence, some some uh, dictionary or iterable or something where we provide basically a map from the say central or peripheral to the, the data, right? So that's all it's doing. It's just packing. It's just taking out the data uh, that we loaded in before. The, the values themselves and putting them into this, this particular format. Same thing with our, our predictions. Uh, in this case, uh, the predictions, we need to store both the, the actual prediction values, this, this Y, right? So we're grabbing this out from our, our uh, reader data, as well as we want to provide the X, right? So this is where we're basically making this correspondence between the bidding that's stored in our data and the predictions that are stored in our, our prediction files. So we can execute that. And uh, now we're well, we're really almost there. Um, the uh, the last step that we really need here is to think about what we're going to do at our our covariance. Okay, and so um, there are many different options we can we can how we can try and address this. Right, this is exactly what what he described before. Um, so for now, we're going to to make an assumption that it's fully uncorrelated. So we're going to say we're going to. And it, we're going to estimate our covariance by assuming basically minus one in terms of our, our correlation uh, length. Um, so what we need to do is we're going to initialize a, a basic covariance based on the data we have available, right? So we need this. We need to extract this structure, and then what we're going to do is we're going to build up our our estimates of our covariance for our different uh, combinations of observables and centralities, right? So again, remember this is our central. In this our peripheral. So this first this first line here, we are uh, right doing the correlation between central and central. The next one's peripheral and peripheral, and then uh, we have our our mix right our, our off diagonal terms. Okay, and for now we're, we'll take a look at what these look like in just a moment. But for now let's just kind of proceed with what we're starting with. Um. So okay, so we've done all this preparation. We're really almost there. Um, we're going to store everything in this, this global dictionary, and the way this package works is basically it keeps track of, of kind of the inputs in this, this pickle file. So we we assign our last required fields here, and we can store that to file. And now we are now we're done with our setup here. We're good to go. Um, okay, I'll pause here for just a moment. I don't think we need to necessarily uh, to to. Um, I don't think we need to pull, but uh, I'll just pause here in case anyone has a quick question they'd like to ask. Okay, uh, I don't hear or see anything yet, so I will continue on, but of course, feel free to interrupt me if you have questions. So, okay, we've done all this work together. Uh, we've understood our, our uh, file specification. We've uh, we set up this, this uh, perhaps a little bit intricate format. What do we get for, for all this work? Um, let's let's take a look at what we have. So um, first, we can just take a look at our, our input data. So our two observables, um, our, our central and our peripheral uh, AJ. And all this code here is just, uh, I've you know, you can go through it on your own time uh, if you want. I've tried to comment really exactly what each line is trying to, to get at. Um, be a little bit more really much, but uh, it can you know it can be a little bit easy to get lost in you know the structure of these dictionaries. 
Um, so, uh, you know, of course, if you're in the notebook, you can always go observe, uh, you know, just enter in the whatever you're uncertain about and see what the values are. But uh, I also try to kind of give you a hint of what's going on. So what we'll do here for these plots, just to, to take a look, is we're going to combine the statistical and systematic uncertainties in quadrature uh, for our, just keeping it simple for our purposes. We can take a look at our plot, and we see this this characteristic shape, um, right? So uh, we see maybe you know we're not seeing the same sort of modification you might we we saw before in say zero to ten percent, uh, but we at least see some. If we look closely here, we can see if you look at a fixed value, there is some difference in our our shape. Um, certainly, as you go to zero, you see this is much more strongly peaked in the peripheral case as opposed to the central. Um, as this, this function of AJ. And uh, right, our uncertainties here are, are something that we've kind of mocked up for the, the toy, which perhaps reflects what we might expect in terms of uh, our systematics uh, of, in, in terms of understanding uh, our background here, for example. So, uh, right, so all that worked, we've got our, we've got our, our first set of values, very good. Um, we can also try and take a look at right. So this is our, our term as data. Let's let's kind of go through the steps we looked at before. So we can also look at, for example, our, our design points. And so what we're looking here is just a scatter of, of the uh, right the the pairs of design points, the forty that we've put in. And generally speaking, uh, particularly as you have these, these higher dimensional spaces, right, you'll want to have some sort of strategy to to try and uh, try and decide how to place these. Um, Often you use something like a Latin hypercube, which I think was discussed earlier this week, um, or you can uh, try and go in a, uh, you can also try and take some sort of iterative approach, for example, um, which I think I maybe mentioned a lot. Um, you know, for example, uh, you could do one batch uh, and then try and see if you can use uh, techniques like active, active learning where you take account of what the uncertainties are um, to, to try and choose your next set of points more judiciously than you might be if you just uh, distribute them evenly. So in this case, um, we've done something very simple, um, kind of randomly distributing our points here. We see we at least have some coverage over the phase base, although uh, um, you know, I'm sure I, I imagine we can probably do better. So, okay, we have this, this distribution. Hopefully this at least gives us enough to, to try and train our emulator. Um, and uh, right, so now we can take these points, right? We've run our simulations somehow. Uh, in this case, I've just handed you the results. Um, and now we can try and make a comparison already with simulations to the input data to see if, uh, you know, we think we might have a chance at uh, describing what data, uh, what the data have done based on this, this toy that we're doing. And so what we do here, right, is we're plotting every single, uh, we're plotting all of our design points, looking at the you know, kind of density of plots, uh, of, of lines here. And, uh, it seems okay. We should have a reasonable opportunity to, you know, to describe our data. We're, we're enveloping our points at some level, um, although you know, it's not clear what region of phase space we might be in. We, of course, won't do that in a phase and analysis. So, lastly, um, the thing we can look at here is, is trying to take a look at our, our covariance matrices. So, we think our, our, our uh, you know, we've seen our data, we think our posture or our, our our, our, our model might be able to describe it. We just need to look at our posterior to figure it out. Um, but what have we done with our correlations? So as, as I'll remind you, right, we, we set our correlation length uh, before here, scrolling back up um, as, uh, as minus one, right, indicating that it's fully uncorrelated. Um, and so we can see what that actually means in our, our plots here, right? So what this is saying is that basically every single point uh, uh, in our central versus central case uh, is uncorrelated with each other, right? So they're, they're just correlated with, with itself. Same with the peripheral case, and then there's no correlation between the two measurements. So uh, we'll come back to this uh, a bit later. We can play with this value sum to, to see what this does uh, for these different correlations. But for now, we'll take the, the simple uncorrelated case uh, for our, our emulator here. Um, Right, and so as I just said, these these kind of reflect the choices we made above. So uh, one one word to the wise here: um, it, it's possible if you uh, um, it, it's possible to confuse yourself if you think you've updated some parameters um, if you don't uh, clear out some temporary some cache files, which save you a lot of time when you're trying to analyze later. Um, 
if you don't clear them out, uh, if you change parameters above, you may confuse yourself and think, oh, I changed this parameter. Why didn't my you know, posterior change? It could be that uh, you're just hitting the cache and so it's better to, uh, so you know, for safety, you, you, uh, if I'm starting a new set of analyses, I will usually clear these out. Um, so, uh, right. So, okay, we've done all this. Uh, any, any questions on our, our plots here before we continue? Okay, uh, I don't see anything in Slack, so I think let's, let's keep going here. Um, so we've been very patient. We set everything up. We've, we've taken a look at our inputs. Now let's actually go do something. Um, and so the way that a lot of this is run, you can do it many different ways, but a straightforward way is just to call the particular module. And so there is an emulator module, which, which handles the Gaussian process emulator. So let's take a look at what options we might be able to try and take advantage of here. Um, I'm just leaving it to help to see what there is. And so uh, you have a few options here. For example, you can set the number of principal components that you're interested in. Uh, you can try and optimize, like restart your optimizer to, to improve where you end up. Um, and uh, there's also an option basically to retrain the emulator even if it's cached, so kind of forcing it to rerun. Um, you can also kind of specify what systems you want it to run on. Although because we have this, this overall all data dictionary, Excuse me. Um, we uh, we can also just run. Uh, we it will know what systems to run over. So uh, without further ado, we can then run our our emulator here, and this will take a moment. Uh, but it's pretty quick, and we see the kind of bottom line here is that it tells us that our eight principal components, which I've you know chosen because I've, I've run this before. Uh, Describe 99.5% of the variance. So it really describes uh, quite all the data. Um, you could try and optimize this different ways to see if you can do better or worse, uh, you know, or what, depending on what level of variance you really want to explain. For our purposes, this should be this should be just fine. Um, and so it's telling you right the parameters we're running here, we're running with this, this matter kernel plus uh, some additional light noise. Um, which will help it uh, from getting kind of stuck in, in particular regions. So, uh, right, it's, since it's a, a simple example, it runs quite quickly. So maybe it's a little bit uh, uh, anticlimactic, but we're already done. We've got our emulator train. Um, now, in the case of, of the, this, the package here, uh, it's only written, the results are only written to file. So this, this cache, which I mentioned before, is you know tricking up. It also can be quite useful if you you know don't want to have to keep running, or you, you know, certainly if you're running more observables, this can take much more time to train than, than this example here. Um, and so uh, since we want to look at what the emulator has done, we're gonna step back and, and reload the emulator so we can look at it in our notebook. To do that, all you have to do here is run this this uh, this, this line here, and now we'll have our emulator available to, to try and run some experiments with. Um, so now let's let's take a look at what our emulator has done. Um, we can just try a few different predictions to see to see kind of what the values are. So and how it compares to our data. This is of course not our our uh, um, this is not our, our full process, right? But just to kind of see what it looks like. Um, so we can start with saying zero for A and 0.25 for B, and this does fairly worth the central, but really misses for the peripheral, right? Uh, you can try some more values, uh, which you can play with here. Um, like for example, we might try 0.2 and 0.1 just to see what it's looking like, right? And okay, maybe that's a little bit better, but I'm just guessing values, right? So, uh, you know, we can see at least it seems kind of sensical. If I try values outside of my range, right, the emulator is not really constrained there, and so we don't know necessarily what will out of this. So, right, I put in something, right, our range is 0. Point, was uh, 0 to 0. 0.3, I put in 0. 0.5, and suddenly we get this very odd shape, right? So, uh, you know, it's a reminder that if you want to try and constrain your emulator, you, of course, need to be in, uh, you know, you need to provide it with predictions to, to actually train on. If you go outside that range, you, you know, may or not be getting meaningful information. Um, okay, so uh, maybe we can pause here for uh, 30 seconds or so, uh, make sure that folks are on track and also that you play with these, these predictions a little bit if you want to see what happens. 
um, when you're when you're ready to go, then you can put a put a in check. I guess we can also pause here for questions if there are any questions. Yeah, it seems like we got a few uh, check marks as well. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I suppose we can keep going here then. Okay. Um, great. So, all right. So we've got our predictions uh, all set up. We've got our, our Gaussian process. We uh, got to make sure that we stay in range, but we can we can try and keep going from here. So now that we have this, let's uh, move on to our our MCMC sampling. And so, unsurprisingly. Sorry. Unsurprisingly, uh, we have another module, this time managing our, our MCMC, uh, again, with some nice helpful uh, health information, right? which again, gives you some, some different options here. So one, uh, for example, telling you whether you configure the number of walkers, so how many different chains are you, you sampling through the phase space with, how many burn-in steps. Um, so uh, right, we uh, will eventually converge to some value, but it may take some time to get to that point. Um, so we might want to throw out those, those burning steps uh, as it's starting to, to, to move towards convergence. Um, you can also ask for some kind of additional status every number of steps. Um, and then lastly, you'll always want to pass kind of telling you the number of steps that you actually want to run. So in this case, what I'm going to do is we'll run 100 walkers. So 100 of these chains, we'll do 200 steps of burn in. And then we'll run a further 200 steps. Um, so this is this is basically to keep this brief and just so we can keep going. But uh, you know, for a real analysis, you'll need to do much much larger numbers of steps than what we're doing here. Um, so okay, with that, we can start running. And it'll tell us uh, some information about how it's running. Um, so we're running. Uh, Right, so we do so it, it runs through for a while and then it resamples and continues. Right, so now it's, it's done 100 steps, adding to 200. It starts, it's finished its burn in. Now we'll keep going. Uh, again, we'll continue these steps. Uh, and we've already finished and the chain has been in the file. So, much in the same way as the, the, um, the emulator writes to file, so you, it can cache and you don't have to run the step every time, which uh, you know, can be very expensive. Uh, we again, we, in this case from CMZ, we also write the, the chain to, to a file so that we can cache it and you don't have to do more expensive steps. Uh, you know, this is of course cheap compared to running the full set of simulations, but it can take some time still. Um, and so since we've done that, let's let's uh, load our uh, MCMC examples so that we can take a look at what, they, at what they, they've done for us. Um, so in this case, you just need this particular set of code uh, 
we can discuss, but uh, it's just a detail, I think. Okay. Um, I will pause for just a second. I think that MCMC is pretty quick for most folks, but maybe we can just do one more uh, set of checks to, to make sure that uh, no one's getting left behind there. Okay, uh, I'm not seeing a ton of checks here. Uh, if, if folks are having problems or just waiting, uh, maybe you can uh, try to take a second. But uh, if there are any questions, please please feel free to ask. Um, maybe a Slack or maybe some chat and we can try and get you some. Uh, I'm not sure if the function of, of how many folks are closely following along. Maybe if you're still waiting on this to run, could you put a maybe an X or something uh, for your status? Okay, there's a uh, one checkbox, so I don't know if folks are okay. done or they're. Uh, so yeah, if you, if you are you know caught up uh, up to speed with the the hands on, just give a check mark. Okay. Okay. So I, I do see one issue which uh, in the in the oh, in Slack, Slack yes, in Slack which uh, we can address now. So mm -hmm. I'm I'm gonna guess that. Uh, oh, there's a lot of people that have there. Yeah, that's great. Oh, okay. Um, do we, interesting. Do okay. I. Uh, Okay, well, fine. Um, so uh, I, I, ch I, I tried to check this on the, uh, the container and I got it to run successfully, but I, I guess something went awry. So um, what you can do here is, uh, so if you see my cursor, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have it install the dependencies of, um, of the, the stat package. Um, they should be in the default container, but perhaps over the week, it's the dependencies have changed. So what you want to do is you want to type what I've done here. So you have this this uh, 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 present and then pip install dash r requirements dot text, uh, and uh, don't put a space between the present and pip. And what this will do is uh, it will okay, throw a lot of text at you. But what you want to particularly check for is this particular line. So EMCE needs to be less than 2.2.1. Um, if it's something more recent, that's why you get that, that particular error. Um, so, um, so maybe I can ask, uh, once folks have run that, if they, what version of EMCE they see they have there. Um, I suspect because you, know, you also you might need a if that doesn't work you might need a dash dash upgrade as well. Um, you're fine to, to do that. Um, if that does if that does work correctly. Or if it does seem that you, you're, if it, so right in my case, it says requirements already satisfied because mine's already set up this way. Uh, if you find that one of these packages has changed, um, you'll need to restart the kernel. Um, so to do that, you will have to go up to kernel uh, and you want to say restart. 
um, and this will clear your whole state. Um, and then you want to run up to this point, which uh, if you go to here, uh, if you go to that cell, you should be able to say, um, uh, uh, I guess, uh, you're, you're not, uh, to say run all above because uh, I don't know, hit install again. Um, and this is this will take a moment because now it's going to go rerun all the steps that we just did, but it shouldn't take so so especially long. Um, mine's already back to Trinity and CMC. Um, okay, perfect. So I'm looking at the stat, uh, check. Okay, perfect. That uh, folks had to downgrade. Okay, very good. Um, so, okay, could I show the MCMC output again? Uh, yes, uh, here this is. Um, Okay, so I think we'll we'll wait here for a minute or two to let folks uh, catch up through running all the cells. Um, now that can take a minute. Um, can you please, um, yeah, could you please, if it works, uh, please put a check. And if not, uh, let's uh, keep discussing on, on Slack to figure out what's, what's going on. Okay, great seeing some check marks roll in here. Very good. Okay, uh, so it's slowly done up here. We'll wait for a few more seconds here to let folks finish up. Okay, great. Uh, looks like we're about there. Um, if uh, yeah, if you continue to have this issue and somehow this pip uh, install doesn't work, uh, please yeah, please post on the Slack. Uh, otherwise, I think we'll we'll continue on here. Thanks. Uh, thanks for bearing with me here. Um, okay, so we did this. Um, not sure I actually executed this uh, this line, so I'm going to do it again just to be sure. We don't need to execute this pip line again. Um, so I'm going to collapse. Okay, I'm not, not going to collapse this. We can't get into that right now. Anyway, um, fine. So now we're on to uh, you know looking at what we actually done, right? So uh, we've actually we've actually run our our MCMC, right? We've we've uh, sampled our, our posterior distribution by by exploiting this this phase space. So now let's uh, take a look at, at our performance, both uh, you know in terms of our MCMZ as well as how our posterior actually does. So as a first step, we can look at um, trying to kind of uh, get a general sense of the MCMC performance. And so what we'll do here is we'll kind of we'll try and plot the values that uh, it explores as a function of uh, the step size going going through the process. So if we look at this plot here. Uh, Basically, what we've done is, is as I said, we, we've asked the the uh, we've asked it to move through the phase space and kind of tell us where the values it samples are. Um, we only look at a subset of these just to to make it viewable. Um, and note that these scales are quite restricted here. Um, so uh, you know, we see in general basically that already by these these two hundred steps of turn in the uh, burning. Excuse me, we we have. Kind of visually by eye seem to be preferentially exploring this region of our of our posterior. Um, so uh, right, so we can already kind of see this by eye. Um, so you know, if one wants to do this, uh, you know, more broadly, you need to you know investigate the performance more. But this is gives us kind of a broad uh, a broad view. So um, next, let's let's take our our. Maybe exciting and uh, uh, exciting steps, and let's take a look at, at what our 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 joint and 
um, individual posterior distributions. And what we see here is um, we see right, these, this very, very stark correlation uh, clearly showing this, this preferred value for both A and B around uh, right, 0.25 and, and 0.1. Um, and right, if we look at our joint distribution here, we see it's really uh, clearly this is quite a, quite a well-constrained region, um, which is you know, perhaps what we expect from a, a simple toy model. Um, OK, so I think you've seen these plots before, so I think this shouldn't be uh, any surprise. But um, the point is, uh, right, this is really just a kind of applying exercise at this point and trying to understand what we, what we see. Um, but of course, uh, as I showed, for example, in my presentation, having some constrained parameters isn't necessarily enough from your, your posterior, isn't necessarily enough to say that your model's really done well, right? Your model has to also be able to describe your data, for example. And so uh, we can do that. We can, we can try and take a look at, at basically sampling our, our market chain Monte Carlo. We'll, we'll randomly pick some values out of this, uh, out, of, out of the whole set of samples that we have. And we'll ask our emulator to predict what those, those values are for those, those parameters that it samples out. And we can compare what those look like compared to our, our, our data that we plotted before. And so this, this block, for example, should look very familiar, right? We're just doing the steps to extract our data to be able to plot it. And we're going to, again, compare with our statistical and systematic uncertainty data in the plotter. So take a second, because we can, we're sampling a good bit of data here. Um, OK, fine. Uh, and then what we see here is that uh, um, we see really a very nice uh, description of our data by our posterior distribution, both in the central case and in the peripheral case. Um, so uh, really, you know, within our data uncertainties, uh, we see that our, our model does quite well. Um, again, this is a toy, right? Uh, we should, I think we well hope that that's what we would see, but nonetheless, it's uh, it's certainly reassuring to see that that we've uh, been able to go through these steps with the the stat package and, and be able to to come to this uh, this description to uh, you know of our data. So um, right, so kind of at this level, excellent, we've made it. Um, so there are a few things that I want to highlight here. Then going back, so now that we've gone through this whole experience and done all the you know done all this this work, um, what I want to highlight is that in the end. The package makes things pretty simple, right? In terms of the steps that you actually need to do, right? You load your data. That's where it, I was just visualizing, right? You need to load your data up here. You're setting your correlation links, right? This is all kind of configuration at some level, right? I'm putting all the pieces together, um, and then once you've done that, uh, you're already, you know, uh, a long way to the process, right? All this visualization is of course important, and you know, if you're really going to try and uh, you know publish an analysis. You need to, to check all these things, right? You can't ignore them. But in terms of kind of steps that you actually need to do them, uh, right? You have to run your, your guessing process emulator. This takes one line, right? You need to run your, your uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling. Again, this takes one line. We've taken care of the details for you. And then you can kind of just jump ahead to, uh, you know, really trying to understand the performance and your sampling and your posterior and really how you're able to describe your, your data. Um, and you know, hopefully, if all these pieces work, you might get a very nice description uh, here, or you know, a more realistic example like what what the way Al showed yesterday with the uh, jet scape analysis in the soft sector. So um, I'll pause there for a moment for questions. If there's anything people want to discuss. Okay, uh, I don't appear to see anything yet. Um, maybe we can pause and ask the a question back. So my next step here is going to at least be vary this uh, correlation length a little bit and see what happens to the analysis. Um, but uh, I wanted to check if, if that was either something you wanted to cover or whether you had other content you wanted to cover in that, in that direction. Um, no, so yeah, please okay. come Okay, thanks. Uh, okay, I will I will go for it then. Um, okay, so uh, this is optional. I'm going to briefly close all the plots just to save a little bit of memory. Um, we'll recreate them in a moment. Um, 
what I want to do then is, is go back to these, these correlation lengths that, uh, and, these, and how we handle these covariance uh, uh, between uncertainties that, that he discussed in the lecture. And so, right, again, going back, right, in this first case, we just chose everything to be uncorrelated, right? So we just have uh, this, this diagonal correlation between the same values, and that's that, right? But what does it look like if we change some values? So let's scroll back up here. This went a little bit too far, right? And there's these two values we can play with: our, our correlation length and our off-diagonal correlation length. You can, I mean, you can, you don't necessarily have to, or I mean, you can play with these as you like. But um, this is just kind of a convenient way to think about things. So, um, you know, what does it mean to actually change these? Well, let's see, for example, what it looks like if we go for fully correlated um, for both cases. And okay, there we go. Right, so we would do it both for the, the correlation length as well as the, the off diagonal. Okay, and we'll reinitialize our, our estimation of our, our covariance here. Okay, and we execute this and it just does its thing. Um, we, of course, we need to make sure that we load our covariance into our, our system here. So um, you want to make sure you also execute this, this next cell as well, right, where we define our covariance. Okay. Um, and so we've stored this. Let's take a look at what it does in terms of our, our uh, for example, how we change our visualization. So again, we we uh, set them to be fully correlated. And so if we look, we get these giant uh, yellow blobs, right? What this is saying is, is that uh, every bin is correlated with every other bin, right? So that means you know my bin here is correlated uh, fully with my my. Uh, no, bin zero, right? Every everything is correlated everywhere, and not only for the diagonal terms of central versus central, but also with central and peripheral, for example. Right? Okay, fine. That's a maybe a little bit extreme case. We can also look at some kind of intermediate values. Um, so, for example, right, we might try 0.1 as some sort of partially correlated exercise. Uh, if we want to see the differences, maybe we put the the off diagonal correlation length as 0.2. Uh, arbitrarily selected here. So again, we'll execute our cells. Let's take a look at what it looks like. We can take a look here and we see, okay. Uh, so we see a fairly strong, right in our uh, you know same to same case, we see a fairly strong correlation, but now there is some correlation, right? So for this bin, it correlates some with the it is bins that are close to it, but doesn't really correlate with ones that are far away. Um, and then notice of course that because we set a, a stronger, uh, a larger length for our, our off diagonal terms, right? It means that our correlation is unsurprisingly broader here, right? There's there's longer, there's a further distance you can correlate between these different bins, okay? Um, so how you wanna try and uh, set this up or or what values you might choose, right? Really depends on your understanding of the, the uncertainties in the experiment, right? So maybe they publish the full covariance matrix and you don't even have to think at all. You can just uh, read it in and, and move on with your day. Uh, fortunately, it's not, not so terribly common, uh, but you might at least have some sense of how particular contributions uh, correlate. You know, with, the, with this, this estimate covariance, you can combine them together um, so that you can account for these different sources. So just for the sake of, of trying an exercise, let's let's try one of these out. Um, and uh, for the sake of, I understand what's uh, going on with this one, or uh, for the sake of maybe some familiarity, uh, let's, let's try. So we did fully uncorrelated before, let's do fully correlated this time, okay? And um, okay, again, we, so we execute that. And we want to execute this, this second uh, the second cell to make sure we load in the data. We can jump down from our visualization. Uh, remember, this showed us the fully correlated uh, for all the different bins. Um, and uh, yeah, we can we can give it a try to run our Gaussian process again, as well as our Markovian Monte Carlo, and see what it does to our posterior distribution. Okay, so we run our our emulator. We can read it back in. Uh, this is just some visualizations. We don't have to do that step for this, this exercise. Again, now we'll just run our Markovich and Monte Carlo. And as fast as it takes to run the two things, we're already, we've run our analysis for this new set of parameters and uh, it's already almost done here. Okay, it's written chain to file, so that means it's done. We can load it in to our 
MCMC again. Uh, we, we can load it into our notebook here. And uh, let's take a look at, at what this all looks like. Um, so uh, we can look at, for example, let's just start with our, our extracted parameters perhaps. And so this is what it looks like right now, right? So we have it fairly well constrained, but there is some width to distribution. This one's more narrow, but still some width. And if we run it now, you see that it's quite a bit more constrained, right? The, the, the width of this distribution has gotten a lot narrower. Um, right, and so uh, one can think of this in terms of uh, how the uncertainties are moving. If, uh, right, this gives you some additional set of constraints. Um, you know, as a curve moves in one direction, the other one's going to move with it, right? And so this, this can give you some opportunity to, to try and put more precise constraints than if you don't have that additional set of information, right? So whether, you know, fully correlated makes sense, uh, you know, in our toy, well, we can decide it does, um, you know, whether it does in the physics that you're, you're working on, um, you know, you need to try and use as much information as you have available and, um, and uh, you know, estimate the best you can and provide the information what you what you've done. Um, so uh, yeah, so you can you can go back and uh, you know play with these different uncertainties, uh, these, these correlation lengths, and see what it does uh, you know to your to your different values that you extract. Um, it may you know may not have a big impact. It may not. It also may not converge. So it you know it really depends on um, what you what you look at um, and. Uh, yeah, how how it's how well described the data. Right. So again, I think you'll if you remember the previous plot, I think our uncertainties are smaller here. Uh, right. Our samples of posterior are more more tight packed together. Right. Which you'd expect from this much more narrow distribution. Uh, okay. So um, yeah. So that that about brings me to the end of what I wanted to cover for today. Um, are there any any questions on the things that we've gone through here? Okay, I'm not hearing anything here. Um, don't yeah, there's anything. no questions on Slack either. So, okay, looks like everyone is um, on the same page. Okay, very good. So, just as a reminder, right? So, I linked to from the the Indico. I linked to this particular. Um, I linked to our repository here. This has our exercises here. You can see we have ones from other summer schools. If you want to go back and look at those, um, as well as our, our main code base here. Um, so. Um, there are, you know, kind of fits and starts to the activity here, but it's certainly um, a package that you can take advantage of to, to try and do some explorations yourself um, and uh, yeah, better understand kind of, uh, for example, with this toy is, you know, it can be very nice. It's very simple, of course, but, uh, you know, simple can be very useful for building intuition and understanding the kind of underlying processes that are, are going on. Um, yeah, so with that, um, if there are any more questions, I think I will close here. Awesome. So thanks again, Raymond and Yeah, that was great. Um, so if there's no other questions, I think we can um, call it a day. Uh, and so I think tomorrow we'll start up at 9.30. Uh, so hopefully we'll see all of you there. Okay. Uh, Chun, anything else to add uh, before we, we end up? No, just a special talk. Tomorrow we'll start 30 minutes later than the usual. No, mm -hmm. Awesome. Great. Well, thanks again, Raymond and Yi, and thanks again, everyone, for attending the, today. All right. Talk to you later. Bye.